This is episode 10 of the Magic Detective podcast. On this episode, we talk about the amazing life of Harry Keller, chapter three, which is Harry Keller in retirement. That and more on the Magic Detective podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 10. Before I start this episode, I have a favor to ask all of my listeners. Right now, before we get into the feature, please, if you could do three things, like, share, and subscribe uh, to the podcast. Uh, If you're listening on iTunes, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, give the podcast five stars. The ratings, by the way, they help me gather a larger audience, and that is ultimately the goal, to uh, get as many listeners as possible. I I work really hard to give you good, solid content for free, so I I hope you like it. And the only way that I know you like it is by uh, giving comments or ratings and that kind of thing. Um, Most of the platforms that I'm on have some sort of uh, rating system, whether it's Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Music, whatever. Uh, So you can like, share, and subscribe on pretty much any of them. So if you could do that now, I'll wait. Or you can do it after the podcast too. That's fine. Um, But just don't forget. Okay, thanks. All right. So uh, episode 10 marks the final episode for 2018. And it's also the last episode in the three part series on the life of Harry Keller. Uh, And now I'm going to delve into his retirement. In the last podcast, I mentioned that in 1908, Keller sold his show to Howard Thurston. And on May 9th of that year, he passed the mantle of magic over to Thurston. For a mere $5,000, Thurston purchased the entire Keller show, all of the illusions, Flato, the shrine of Kumra Sami, the self-decapitation, the Casadega propaganda, the witch, the sailor, and the enchanted monkey, the spirit cabinet psycho, the Keller levitation, and much, much more. The newly retired Grand Master of Magic took a much-needed vacation to Atlantic City. And while enjoying the weather and the wind, sand, and the ocean, Keller also met up with Harry Houdini. Keller was 59 years old. Houdini was at the top of his game. He was 34 years old. The two magicians had met in the past, but their friendship really blossoms here in Atlantic City. Uh, There's a a wonderful photo in the Keller's Wonders book by Mike Caveney. It's on page 462, and it's a picture of Harry and Eva Keller, Harry and Bess Houdini, and also Cecilia Weiss. Houdini's mother. And it's ironic because if you think back in 1896, a struggling Houdini sent a letter to both Herman and Keller looking for work. Herman never answered. And Keller did answer back, but his answer was basically saying we have no room for for any help in the show at this time. And looking back, that was good news for Houdini, actually, for... uh, he had a different direction to go. I'll share more about the Houdini and Keller connection uh, in a few moments. Right now, I'd like to delve more into this purchase of the Keller show because it wasn't all sunshine and roses, as you might think. Now, along with the purchase, uh, Keller's two main assistants, Fritz and Carl Buca, went to work for Thurston, as did Keller's manager, Dudley McAdow. Uh, Thurston did purchased the entire Keller show, but he only put two items from the Keller show into his existing act. Those two items were the Keller levitation and the spirit cabinet. The rest of it was sold off to other performers. And it turns out one of those performers was Charles Carter. Uh, He picked up Keller's Flido illusion and he picked up the uh, Robinson out of sight illusion. He also picked up Psycho the automaton. Carter was also after something else. He wanted the Keller levitation and he couldn't get it. So uh, what did Carter do? Well, you could say he pulled a Keller. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, Carter wanted the Keller levitation. And in the end, it appears that was really the only thing that Thurston wanted, at least as far as props. And Thurston wasn't letting it go. So Charles Carter hired away Fritz and Carl Buca from the Thurston show. They, like Paul Valadon before him, knew the inner workings of the levitation. 
and were able to build a levitation for Charles Carter, which oddly became known as the Carter Levitation, but was really now the uh, ripped-off Keller Levitation. Harry Keller caught word of it and was not too happy, especially when he received a letter from Charles Carter asking about some specifics uh, having to do with the trick, and that really irked old Harry Keller. And he let Thurston know about it, but, uh, you know, how mad could he really get? I mean, you know, he had already sold the show after all, and he kind of did the same thing to John Neville Maskelin back in the day. So in 1909, Harry and Eva Keller bought a new house in Los Angeles, California. Keller fell in love with Southern California, and uh, he just loved, loved the weather there, and he decided to stay. Sadly, only one year later, Eva Keller died of heart failure at the young age of 47. Harry Keller was devastated by the sudden death of his wife, co-star and lifelong traveling companion. And it took him a, it took him a full year uh, for him to really emerge from his grief. But uh, when he did recover, he embraced two passions, fishing and magic. This time, though, the magic was a hobby a way to fool friends and associates, Keller had no plans to return to the stage. Instead, he enjoyed learning uh, new magic, rubbing shoulders with his old magic buddies and, and, and seeing shows of his, uh, of his old friends. One very exciting moment for Keller was when he visited David P. Abbott in Omaha, Nebraska. Abbott had created a little mystery called the Talking Tea Kettle. It was an amazing device for that time period. You could take the uh, the spout of the tea kettle and hold it to your ear and actually hear someone inside the kettle. Now, uh, this was a, just a paper mache kettle. It wasn't even a real tea kettle. It was it was just fascinating. You could even carry on a conversation with the person that was apparently inside this thing. And Keller saw it and he had to have one. And indeed he did purchase it and had it installed in his home. And he used it many, many times to surprise guests and friends who visited him. In 1917, one of Keller's uh, trips to New York City, he was invited to attend a special showing of Dr. Hooker's Impossibilities show. Uh, the main effect in this show was a rising card routine that was all the rage. And the reason it was all the rage was because it fooled everyone who saw it, magician, layperson alike. And Keller was dumbfounded by the mystery, and Dr. Hooker, who was not a professional magician at all, invited Keller to actually see how it worked. And again, Keller was amazed beyond words. Actually, he, he did have words. He asked Hooker if he could have his permission to put this same amazing effect into his home in Los Angeles. And I guess Hooker was um, flattered by Keller's request and, and gave him permission to do it. And um, I don't know that if Keller ever finished it, though, but uh, he did get Dr. Hooker's permission to put it in his his home. Whenever he traveled, uh, Keller that is, whenever he traveled, uh, and, and if he was asked to perform something, he had three tricks. They were kind of his go-to tricks that he would pick from. The first was uh, the cut and restored string trick was a favorite of his. Then he also did the Chingling Fu paper tear, and finally his own uh, his own rope tie, which was is known today as the Keller rope tie. Interesting side note about the Chingling Fu paper tear. Keller actually ran into Fu at a function and performed the very routine for his old friend and fooled him. Apparently, Keller had altered the methodology over time. And let's face it, this is the mark of a master. And, um, and he was able to fool Chingling Fu with his own trick. And if I could back up for a moment, back to 1916, uh, in 1916, Keller was in New York again, in New York City, and he was at a meeting of the Society of American Magicians, and it was at this meeting that the decision was made to start local chapters throughout the country, and these chapters would be called assemblies. Houdini and Keller both stepped up and agreed to spread the word, and it's no doubt through their efforts that today the Society of American Magicians has assemblies all over the United States and even throughout the world. Another interesting uh, SAM item took place when Houdini was president of the organization. He nominated Harry Keller to be Dean of Magicians, and he was unanimously voted in. On November 11th, 1917, Houdini coaxed Harry Keller into coming out of retirement for one evening. 
This was so that he could be part of an all-star cast at the Hippodrome Theater in New York City. The event was to raise money for the victims and families of members of the SS Antilles. And this was an American transport ship that had been torpedoed by a German submarine. On the evening of the 11th, Houdini acted as host and MC for the first half of the show. He even presented his water torture cell. But the real thrill that night came from Harry Keller who treated the audience to his amazing floating table routine, and he followed this with his spirit cabinet. After his performance, Houdini stepped on stage with roses for the Grandmaster. Then he brought on a sedan chair, and members of the show picked up Keller sitting in the sedan chair and marched him across the stage as the entire audience got up and sang Old Lang Syne. It was a night to remember, and Keller was so taken with the gesture that it was difficult for him to express himself afterwards. A few days later, he did. Um, he wrote a letter, a very heartfelt letter to Houdini, in which he said, You gave me the proudest and happiest evening in all of my life, and a farewell that can never be surpassed. Houdini followed this letter with a letter back to Keller, in which he basically said it was an honor to be able to give back to such a beloved man and magician. While Charles Carter was performing in Los Angeles, Keller went to see the show, and while there, he convinced Charles Carter to sell his old automaton psycho back to him. Then, in May of 1919, Harry Keller received a letter and a package from Harry Keller. It was psycho, and Keller was giving his old automaton friend to Houdini as a gift. This was actually not the only gift Houdini received from his old friend Keller. According to Edward Saint, Houdini had a jeweled question mark pin that he received as a gift from Keller. This pin apparently has been lost to time. Keller also gave Houdini his spirit cabinet that he used in that farewell performance I mentioned just a few moments ago. And I'm very curious if this spirit cabinet survives today. Keller and Houdini were close friends, but they also had a bit of a business relationship as well. Houdini had started the Film Development Corporation, and Keller became one of the investors. Unfortunately, this was not the high point of their relationship. The FDC struggled to make money, and uh, Keller often spoke to Houdini about getting rid of his shares of stock. Keller's concern, it turns out, wasn't about losing money, but instead about being responsible to creditors for future money. Keller encouraged Houdini to get out as well. He felt it would be a terrible shame for Houdini to lose all the money he had worked so hard for during his career on a bad business venture. Houdini's concern was less over money and more over losing his friendship with Keller over this deal. One plus to the movie business was that it put Houdini in California, and the studio uh, that he was making movies with was only a few miles from where Harry Keller lived. Keller survived a, a stroke at one point and wasn't mobile enough to, uh, to, to get around as, as much. Houdini visited him often and made arrangement for flowers uh, to be sent to his home every week. During at least one visit, Houdini was able to capture Keller on film, thus preserving his image for posterity. Imagine how thrilling it would, would have been to just sit in a room while these two giants spoke about all things mysterious and magical. Keller thought of Houdini as a son, and it was obvious that Keller was a father figure to Houdini. He was probably the only living magician that Houdini even looked up to. However, though their friendship was filled with mutual admiration, they did not agree on everything. For example, Houdini let people know that all his effects were presented by purely natural means. Uh, His expression, my mind is the key that sets me free, um, expresses this perfectly. But read what Keller thought. Here's a quote. Make your work artistic by clothing each illusion with all the glamour and shadows of fairyland and the suggestions of incantations and supernatural powers in order to prepare the observer's mind for a mystery, though there be no mystery. Keller filled his promotional materials with demons and supernatural beings, and Houdini, on the other hand, was totally against the suggestion of supernatural powers in his performance. It's safe to say, though, that they agreed in most areas. Keller believed that tricks performed by the masters who came before him would no longer fool even children, 
and it was the modern magician's job to constantly update and improve the effects and the methods. Houdini took older tricks and made them new, like the needle trick, or he repackaged them to fit him, like the subtrunk, or created brand new effects, like the water torture cell. They both debunked spiritualist phenomenon in their shows. Interestingly, Keller is probably best known for his rope tie. Houdini, of course, was a master of rope ties and rope escapes. Um, after Chung Ling Su died on stage doing the bullet catch, Houdini made plans to add this dangerous bullet catching routine to his show. When the news reached Harry Keller, he sent a fast and firm reply to Houdini, and I believe his words were, don't do the damn bullet catch. We cannot afford to lose Houdini, or something to that effect. And Houdini actually heeded his, the advice of his old friend and chose not to present the bullet catch ever at that point. Harry Keller was probably the only person who could scold Houdini and get away with it, but uh, the letter over the bullet catch was sent more out of concern and caring for his friend than it was really a rebuke. I'd like to get back to Thurston for a moment. Keller was a huge supporter of Thurston's career, and I don't believe he would have sold his show to someone he didn't like and care for, but Keller was disturbed by the, the lack of correspondence that he received from, or didn't receive from Thurston. And when he learned of it, he was, this is Keller, he was quite enraged with Thurston's presentation of the levitation of Princess Karnak, the Keller levitation. Apparently, Thurston had this idea of bringing up spectators from the audience to view the floating lady up close, and this infuriated Keller. And over time, Thurston may have seen the light as he eventually dropped the group of spectators and whittled it down to allowing just a single child to come up and see the levitation. And he was no doubt, you know, giving silent cues to the child to, to get them to say what he wanted or to, or to react the way he wanted, but it didn't thrill Keller at all. He was not happy about it. There's also one other little fact about the levitation you might find interesting. It turns out that Keller, even after retirement, continued to work on improving the levitation. The final product was built by Floyd Thayer at the uh, Thayer Magic Studios. Keller never performed it. Neither did Thurston. Charles Carter, by the way, he wanted it. He wanted to buy it, but um, he what he offered was too cheap. You know, it was a lot less than the asking price, so he never got it. The ultimate Keller levitation was eventually sold to Harry Blackstone Sr. And a, a cool bit of trivia is that Floyd Thayer had the name Keller cast in iron uh, on this little section of apparatus. And the original Keller levitation that Thurston had is long gone. The later version of the Keller levitation only exists in a single part. The rest of it is gone. And um, I have been fortunate enough to see this amazing thing. And I'll be honest, that when I saw it, I didn't notice the name Keller on it. But uh, just uh, before I worked on the podcast today, I brought up a, a photo I have of it. And sure enough, there is the name Keller right there on the base, big as day. It's so cool. In 1921 and 22, Keller faced a number of health challenges. In February of 1922, he went to Chicago to meet with a doctor about his health, but the news, unfortunately, from the doctor was all bad. Coincidentally enough, Houdini was per performing in Chicago at the time, and so the two old showmen had one more chance to get together and see each other. Harry Keller passed away on March 10th, 1922. He had been suffering from a bout of pneumonia and had been coughing up blood. The buildup of blood in his lungs is basically what killed him. He was 73 years old. Houdini was not able to attend the funeral, so he made arrangements for it to be filmed. But to my knowledge, I'm not sure if this film has survived. Houdini referred to Keller as the greatest magician the world ever saw. Harry Cook, by the way, uh, was one of the pallbearers at Keller's funeral. Honorary pallbearers included Floyd Thayer and uh, Claude Cochlin, who was known as Alexander, the man who knows. I'd like to finish up this three-part episode with um, a couple quotes by Harry Keller. I, I think they're pretty cool. The first one is, you can never arrive at the perfection of art until your handling of the illusion produces a thrill of genuine surprise in all who behold it. 
That's a killer quote. Here's another one. The end of all magic is to feed with mystery the human mind, which dearly loves mystery. So leave every mystery forever unexplained. Another great quote. Here's one, the last one. As long as the human mind delights in mysteries, so long it will love magic and be entertained by magicians. Harry Keller. And I hope you have enjoyed this uh, three-part series on the life of Harry Keller. I I think I accidentally called it the uh, the Amazing Harry Keller because there had been a book that I had forgotten about that uh, came out a few years ago, and the book was titled The Amazing Harry Keller um, by Ga- Gail Jarrow, I believe was her name, and it's a children's book about Harry Keller, and it's still available on, on eBay if you uh, if you can pick it up because it's really cool. Um, it's a, just a condensed version of the Keller's Wonders uh, book. The Keller's Wonders book is almost 600 pages, and um, the Gail Jarrow book is, is uh, well, it's a kid's book, and it's much, uh, much smaller, but it still contains great photos from Keller's life and reproductions of his posters and stuff. And I have seen it on eBay. I have several copies myself, so I would encourage you to check that out. But please don't stop listening to the podcast right now because I have more to talk about. There's one more bit of Keller information that I want to share with you, but I'm not going to discuss it here on the podcast. I want to point you to where you can find the article. Uh, The article is on my blog at themagicdetective.com, and the article is called Keller's Last Mystery. And basically what it is, it it talks about the, uh, the remains of Harry Keller and how they are not where they're supposed to be or not where they're they were thought to be. It's a very interesting little bit of detective work that uh, I stumbled upon and received some help from some pretty famous magic historians as well. So that's over on my blog at uh, themagicdetective.com, and it's Keller's Last Mystery. And what I'll do, when I put the uh, notes for episode 10 up, I will include a link to that particular article so you can find out uh, what happened to the remains of Harry Keller. And that is the end of our three-part series on Harry Keller. But uh, now I've got to take a few minutes and do some explaining. Um, You may have noticed that there was a like a month-long break between episode eight and episode nine. And there's a reason for that. And um, I just thought I would share it with everyone. Um, In August of this year, 2018, I found out that my mom had stage four lung cancer. So when my summer tour was over at the end of August, I packed up everything and I came to Nashville where she lived. And I spent the entire month of September here in Nashville uh, helping her through uh, her first chemo treatments. And uh, then in October, I returned home uh, because I had a whole month of uh, shows in October. So I had to do those. And uh, I had planned to return to Nashville around Thanksgiving. That was my original plan. But I I had a feeling that something wasn't right. Um, So I decided to go ahead and cancel all of my shows in the month of November. And uh, not only did I cancel all my shows, but I had a week-long marketing conference that I had already prepaid uh, to, to, to attend. I canceled that. I had uh, been scheduled to perform on the Saturday night uh, uh, show for the Yankee Gathering, and I had to cancel that. And I just felt like uh, it was the best thing to do because I, di- I didn't want to leave somebody hanging at the last minute. And so I just said, okay, I'm, I'm going to cancel all this. I'm going to go to Nashville and hopefully help out as much as I can. So that's what I did. So in November, I spent the entire month of November in Nashville. Unfortunately, uh, I've been here since. So I was there throughout November and, uh, and December. It's December now, so I've been here the whole time. Uh, around Thanksgiving, I saw a pretty dramatic decline in my mom's health and it was a pretty rapid decline. Um, she passed away on December the 8th 
here at home. She was home. Uh, I was there, my brother and his wife and daughter. So she was surrounded by family when she passed. And uh, it's about as heartbreaking a thing as you can imagine. So, um, but I've been here in Nashville trying to take care of uh, her house and uh, all the belongings and doing all the things that you have to do when you lose a parent. Um, Now I've lost both of my parents in two years' time. So, uh, needless to say, I didn't feel like doing the podcast. I didn't really feel like doing anything but helping my mom, uh, to be honest. And uh, so you haven't seen new articles over on the Magic Detective blog. You haven't heard new podcasts uh, until just a few days ago when I did episode 9 and now episode 10. So so that's the story. That's uh, what's happened. And um, do I feel like doing the podcast now? Yes and no, to be honest with you. Um, part of me doesn't want to do it, but part of me doesn't want to do anything. It's the whole grief process, I suppose. And yet part of me wants to do it because it keeps my mind occupied and away from the, you know, uh, the thoughts of all the loss and everything. So, so I will continue doing the podcast just for no other reason to keep my, 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 my thoughts in order and my brain right. And hopefully work through the grief here. So, uh, that's a little personal information, but I thought you needed to know because, uh, like I said, um, some of my friends in the magic world were aware of what was going on. So that's the whole story. Now, you know, um, but let's get back to the podcast here really quickly. Uh, so in 2019 there, I have quite a few plans for the podcast. Certainly I am not intending to stop it or cease doing it. I have uh, bigger plans than that, so I hope to grow the audience. Um, I think I had mentioned in an earlier podcast I was hoping by the end of this year to get a 1,000 listeners. Obviously, that's not going to happen simply because I stopped doing podcasts for a whole month. So, uh, But I just broke the 500 mark, so that's pretty cool. But uh, if you look at my blog, my blog has several million uh, readers, uh, or, or I shouldn't say readers, but several million articles have been read. Uh, did I say that right? That's not right. Um, it's been read several million times. There we go. That's the right way to say that. So, uh, you compare the millions versus, uh, 500 downloads of the podcast. There's a you know big difference there, but it's new. It's only been around since October. So eventually I'd like to have the same kind of numbers that I have over at the blog. And, uh, with your help, if you would let people know, let your friends know about the podcast, that would be uh, that would be great. In 2019, I will be doing some interviews. I've already talked to a couple people about interviewing them for the podcast, and uh, there's a quite a few more that I plan to reach out to and uh, see if they'll be a part of the podcast uh, in inter- interview fashion. So I'm looking forward to that in 2019. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I hope you've enjoyed uh, the Magic Detective podcast this year, the the first 10 episodes, and uh, I look forward to sharing more magic history with you in the coming new year. I hope you have a great holiday. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and you all take care. I'll see you next year.